Why did everyone like this movie? It wasn't very interesting, nor was it groundbreaking. Hell, it wasn't even scary. Yeah, no, really. I, I, I wasn't scared by this movie. I mean, maybe I'm just desensitized after watching so many horror movies over the years, but this is just... This is just boring. Okay, I mean, okay, admittedly, this, this part was a little spooky. It's nice, it's nice to see Darth Maul get work these days, uh, Phantom Menace. This film was directed by the guy who directed Saw, and was written by the guy who wrote Saw. And Saw was considered, for the most part, a, a pretty decent movie. Uh, I liked it well enough, though I haven't seen it in some time. Uh, thankfully, though, these two guys weren't really a part of the further train wreck that was the later Saw series. <laughs> but they did make Insidious together. <sighs> and it was terrible. Number one! God damn it, it was fucking slow. Okay, so I know what you're probably saying, or or at least I made you say this in my head. Why put this part at the beginning? Why why wouldn't you save this piece of information until the very end? Well, well, no. There's there's reason for there's reason for it. If you're one of those people who only watches videos for the first five minutes in order to get the main gist of what's being said, then if I can leave you with only one thing, I want to leave you with this because it's really important. This movie's pacing is slower than a turtle glued to a snail riding the top of your grandma's hatchback on the freeway. This movie takes 20 minutes for the kid to get into the coma. 20 minutes of my time wasted through the first act and all we have to show for it is that the kid's in a fucking coma. <sighs> Luckily, the ghosty shit picks up quick, otherwise, you know, I I'd have turned the movie off by this point. I mean, you'd expect that a film like this is building suspense and tension, but honestly, it's just tired cliche after tired cliche. Boom! Slam the door on you. Oh, is the ghost kid rocking the horse behind the door? Nah. Are those his shoes under the curtain? Psh, nah. Bitch, I was in the cabinet. What? Boo. Boo, motherfucker. Boo. It isn't until fucking 40 minutes that they finally decide to call someone about this ghost nonsense. Do you want to know where another more famous <coughs> the Exorcist <coughs> movie about a possessed little kid decide to finally have the priest show up? Well, it wasn't until the third act, but we're introduced to these two characters very early in the film as we follow them on their path as they lead up to the big exorcism scenes. That's called character development. Write that down, it's gonna be on the quiz. That's using the audience's time wisely. We can build up backstories and, and the methodology to their, their big scenes so we don't have to go through all the bullshit in a half-assed montage that leaves very little to be desired about these characters. When this chick dies, I don't even know her name, we don't even bat an eye at him. Meanwhile, when these two are trying to exercise the fucking devil, we're scared shitless because we empathize with these two. We've gotten to know them up until this point. Good horror. True horror isn't about blood and ghosts and jump scares. It's giving us characters we feel an emotional connection to while also presenting them with a realistic setting that's had time to build up our suspension of disbelief so we feel like this shit could very well happen to us. But because obviously it's a movie, look, it's happening to these other people who we like and now we're scared. There's a reason certain subgenres are made like torture porn and slasher flick. These movies are technically horror, yes, but they aren't pure horror. They get subsidized into their own little compartment. Pure horror plays out with our psyche. And if it's good enough, it scares us down to the bone. Earlier, I said the only spooky moment was this. Well, there you go. The only moment that resonated with, with me with this film was, was a jump scare. The only reason this even stuck out is because it, it was a good jump scare. It, it wasn't something I saw coming at all. It was subtle, and it was to the point, and I actually literally jumped. But the rest of this goddamn movie is so fucking slow as balls that you're just left wishing you could watch the Darth Maul scene over and over again instead of this film. Number two. What the fuck is going on? Y er, I mean, number two, the plot. <clears throat> so the plot of the film is, is pretty messy. It's trying to lead up to this big plot twist. Thing, but really, it's it's just a stupid out of left field thing, and you're like, okay, but why? Okay, uh, okay. So at the start of our movie, we see these two people, 
Dan Everyman and that FBI agent from from the X Men. No, not 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 that X Men. The good X Men. Okay, well the the, the decent X Men. The X Men then didn't make me cringe as much. We see that these people have three children. They have two kids, and they have a baby, and the baby is just really a pointless addition to the film, and it's just there so that we can have the, that one baby monitor scene. Uh, haven't we done baby monitors? Like, that wasn't scary when it was in signs. It's not scary here either. The kid gets himself into a lot of mischief in this creepy old house they live in, and one time he accidentally falls on some steps, and... And we see that scene because it's supposed to like prelude to the the him being in a coma plot, and so soon soon though spooky stuff happens uh, after he's in a coma. So the wife wants to move from this obviously haunted house, uh, so they move to a less haunted house. Except it seems that the ghosty stuff has followed them. So she calls a few people about ghosts and shit, and eventually they settle on this team of paranormal experts and their psychic old lady. And these two really don't make any sense to me, though, especially in the costume department aspect. Are, are they Mormons? Are they paramormons? <laughs> paramormons. <clears throat> anyway, so the Mystery Ink crew here scopes out the house, and they find out that there are indeed ghosts there, and that it's worth contacting this psychic whatever. I I'm sure she gets so many calls these days. Obviously, you have to do a check on the place you're going to. Otherwise, I mean, you can't have her wasting her time on a fake haunting. Ha! <laughs> They find out that the boy isn't actually in a coma, but is being possessed through the spiritual realm. Nothing has taken hold of his body yet, but his astral projection is out there in the spirit world and his body is just waiting to be used like a puppet. Turns out that Darth Maul here is actually a demon who's knocked the kid out of the pilot seat of his own head and is trying to weasel his way in as a vessel to our world. He's been attracting all the ghosts and shit. Luckily, Daddy here actually has the same power as his son, the ability to step into the astral world, outside of his body, and, and into the realm of spirits. He does so, finds his kid in the demon's lair, and brings him back home. <sighs> Twist ending, though. <clears throat> Turns out the dad's soul's been being followed by his own possessing demon since he was a little boy, and it's beginning to corrupt him. Whoa! The demon's corruption pushes him to kill the psychic lady. Whoa! <sighs> I don't know why he does that. Why is he kill her? Whatever. That's where the film ends. On a stupid as fuck cliffhanger. Just... That's it! Number three. The usage of Tiny Tim. <clears throat> if you haven't seen this movie yet, and if you haven't... I mean, I'm sorry I spoiled the whole thing, but then... Not really. Then you're probably gonna be like, What the fuck does Tiny Tim famed falsetto ukulele player have to do with this shitty movie? Well, his song Tiptoe Through the Tulips is kinda sorta the demon's theme song. <clears throat> yeah, I know. So, there's this thing I, I tend to talk a lot about when I'm discussing movies or stories with, with people or sometimes an audience. Uh, on the internet. I, I, I like to call it the cartoon villain trope. Now, I'm not the first person to ever notice this, of course, and it has many other names, albeit, you know, the mustache twirler or the top hat villain or the tie her to the train tracks type villain. All I'm saying is, when, when I say something or someone is a cartoon villain, what I'm trying to say is that the, the actions of the antagonist have become so predictable and or become so ludicrous, especially when those things were meant to be taken seriously, that he no longer is perceived as threatening because he's now a cartoon villain. Y you know, you'd expect it in like a Rocky and Bullwinkle cartoon, not a movie for adults, for serious people. <clears throat> now this film... Might not have been so bad had they tweaked up a few of the plot points that didn't make sense or dropped some of the stuff that was just flawed and maybe gave us, a, you know, clear backstories for some of our heroes, made us care about them more. But no matter what, even, even if all of that had been accomplished, as long as the following scene is left in the film, nothing you can do will ever make it better. Never. Just watch.
This is beyond hilarious. This transcends stupidity to the highest of avails. This makes the bad guy of the film so laughably asinine that any and all instances of him previously, it just becomes a joke. You just, I, you no longer take anything this movie is doing seriously. Not a single bit. Number four, just, just end already. Insidious never ends. And when it does, it's not even a true conclusion. It's a cliffhanger. It, it's expecting to be so good that, that another one is going to be made. And, and that, that's just pretentious. Insidious borrows so many elements from so many other films that it's, it's, it's just sloppily duct taping movies together to get one whole film. There's no emotion to these characters, no care given about whether they live or die. It's entirely reliant on spooky jump scares to try and scare its audience. The people who participate in this situation are only there to put a narrative to all of these elements. They, they, they act as vehicles to the next scary moment rather than real people who were scared to see be scared. But then, after all of that nonsense, after all of the technical discussion involving astral projections and the pseudoscience behind the film, after all of the wasted time watching it, when you finally want it to just be over, it leaves you disturbingly expecting more. The film's climax is actually particularly just non-existence. Sure, the major conflict of the sun being trapped in the astral world coma thing is resolved, but, but there's nothing put to rest. There's, there's no indication that it won't happen again. And worse, the implication that the father's attracted his own demon or whatever means that all of this can happen again at the drop of a hat. So we feel unresolved. We feel like there's more to the story, but, but that's done purposefully. That's done to make you, the audience, feel the need to see the next one and <clears throat> spend your money. See, we as humans have an innate need to have resolved stories, if we can help it. At least in our fiction, because we can control that. It's the same reason why you can flip the channels on TV and find a movie that you've not seen the beginning to, but you're going to still watch it until the very end. That's what I mean. That's the feeling you can't shake when you, you just need to know the ending of the story. But that's manipulation. This, this ending is just, it's just dragging a story to such a long-haul conclusion and then not delivering. Leaving the ending unresolved, just, just begging for a sequel, and, but it doesn't even mean anything. The most popular of stories that also have sequels still have conclusions. You, you can still have a narrative that follows the three-act structure and then still have a continuation. Okay, 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 here, okay, just, 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 here, think about it. Think about Star Wars, for, for an example. Just, just hear me out, okay? Episode 4 wraps up the plot of the Rebellion defeating the Empire pretty nicely, doesn't it? Like, like Luke destroys the Death Star, and, and that had been the, the central conflict of the first film, and, and the Rebellion, you know, they celebrate their victory over the Empire, and the film ends on a high note with everybody receiving medals, except for Chewbacca and whatever, and everybody receives a medal, yeah, right. And then, but remember, though, we also see Darth Vader drifting off into the, ex uh, the, the void of space. It, that represents the fact that we know that the Empire is still going to be out there, and, and that there's plenty of stories left to be told, and then when Episode 5 starts, we can see a different chapter in the story, and we're ready to see that. But we've also still been satisfied by what we saw in Episode 4. I mean, imagine if Episode 4 just ended like this. You'd be pretty damn pissed, right? You need to see the next movie, otherwise you never know if Luke saves the day or not. You never know if the heroes we'd come to love ha had made it. But what if the cliffhanger had your audience thinking it was a shitty movie? What if it did poorly at the box office and then episode 5 never got made? That's why you can't treat two hour films as like chapters in a book. A book uses chapters to divide up the story just to help give the plot a structure, or, or even as a useful stopping point. It's especially helpful in longer novels where, where you don't expect to get a lot of, you know, it read in one sitting. But a movie is the whole thing. It's supposed to be the same enclosed story, li like a book. No one wants to sit through the length it takes to read a whole book only to see that they've gotten through but one chapter. And no one wants
wants to sit through a book that takes three movies to complete? <clears throat> looking at you. Looking at you. But no. This movie decided to leave us all hanging. But you know what? They made another one. <sighs> Number five. Another one. Oh, God damn it! This one is even fucking slower! So, like, I used The Exorcist as an example of, of a movie that this movie clearly used the basic plot of, but The Exorcist did it in such a, you know, a better way. But, but there's another movie I feel like that th this movie was drawing inspiration from, and, and this time it's, it's for the visual and, and, and the pacing style. The movie is slow, right? Eh, well, what's another horror movie that's slow? The Shining. See, Stanley Kubrick was, was pretty fucking good at making movies, especially horror movies. He knew how to pace them and how to shoot them from just the right angles to give us the fullest effect of the story while simultaneously developing characters that have real emotions so we feel real feelings for them when the crazy, scary stuff starts setting in. The Shining is just a little over two and a half hours in length, whereas each of these films are roughly a little over an hour and a half apiece. But The Shining uses every minute it has available to it in great detail. It builds suspense grade by showing us the slow decline into madness that Jack goes through. We're given time to know their family, as well as the strange and eerie things going on in the hotel. We like them enough to make us want to stick around, and slowly but surely we're feeling the stretching of time driving us mad, just like Jack. The length of the film is used as much for the dreadful effect as it is for the symbol of really and truly feeling the way our characters are feeling. Insidious is just long. It's just a bunch of things that take place in order, and it's taking too long to get on with it. You'd, you'd think that, that seeing as this film has all the same characters in it as in the first one, we wouldn't need to take the time to know them, as we've already done that, so maybe this time we can actually, you know, care about their well-being? <laughs> Except that's not the case. And, and not only that, but, but now the father is basically a completely different character, given he's been possessed. The kid from the first movie who was in a coma most of the time, and now he's brand new to us too, because we didn't have a chance to know him in a coma. You know, we're introduced to this new spectral guy who used to work with the psychic lady, and a lot of the time the movie is taking place from his perspective with the paramormons, and, and again, it's just, it's making us this, this long truck through the same territory, but, but with so many new characters that we care even less about the story going on. Number six. What's going on? No, no, seriously, what? The second chapter begins with a flashback. Uh, of course, we're not told it's a flashback, which, which is kind of confused. Remember how the last movie ended like this? Why did you do that? Why would you do that to me when you know how I feel about that? Why? 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 Yeah, yeah, well, uh, apparently it, it's more important to see this flashback so we can just be fucking confused as hell b before we get started. But, I mean, later we do finally get to see, you know, the somewhat conclusion to the end of the first film, but it's sort of just a, you know, no big deal because now we have a whole bunch of new plot to talk about. <laughs> apparently there's, like, a police investigation going on, but also, like, these people in the beginning... Were the psychic lady and and the new guy, but they're but they were younger, and but also Josh is like possessed, but but then there's also this murderer who's the one possessing him. I the plot is in this one. It's really fucking confusing, and not like in a way where I even remotely want to try and get into it. I, okay, I'll try. I'll I'll try. So it turns out that this whole time Josh was being followed by the evil spirit of a murderer and his mother, also dead. And when he goes into the astral plane to save his son, the murderer takes control of his body. Uh, the two paramormons from before contact a guy who had been involved with Josh's original haunting from years prior. So we see that Josh is still stuck in the astral world and, and that the spirit is still causing ghostly havoc in the house. But now, with the Josh being his new host, they decide to try and help him get back to his body. The Paramormons and this new guy are like, let's get Josh back to his body, and then a lot of pointless shit just goes down, and the old guy sort of almost dies. And so when he and Josh are stuck together in the spirit world, they somehow go back 
in time to the events of the first movie within the astral world. This is, of course, very poorly explained. In fact, I'm sorry, it's not even explained how he's able to do that, and we're just given just nothing to let us know why or how. And, but, you know, of course, luckily for the filmmakers, they, they don't even have to shoot new footage here. They, they can just reuse the old stuff. Okay, so then they find the psychic lady who's dead, and, and apparently she's also a time traveler. I don't fucking... So she tells Josh he needs to go back to the darkness and find the mother's home and get her to go back there. And then he travels even further back in time to talk to himself as a child. What are the ramifications of this sudden rampant time travel? Can he cause paradoxes? Can he can he can he just step outside of his body and and travel back in time anytime he wants to? What? Good lord, this is all just so fucking confusing. So it turns out that the mother of the serial killer guy used to make him dress up in girls' clothing and pretend he was a girl, and the implications of that are just I don't even want to go there. And then the son is all like, I can go into the dark place too and I can find dad. And so basically it's just a role reversal from the first film. And then he finds him and then, then they find the mother and then they unsurprisingly get everything pretty much back to normal. Finally they decide to just forget their abilities to travel into the Astro Realm and fucking go back in time and just live normal lives in the real world. So now, I, I guess the psychic lady is a ghost helping the two paramormons with others who have been inflicted by the possessing demons and ghosts of the world. But, wouldn't you know it, as the film ends, the psychic lady stares off into the distance only to see something we're not given the privilege to see. It is again, to find another fucking cliffhanger. By the way, yes, they're making a third one. <clears throat> Comes out next year. At least this time our main character's stories were resolved, you know, before we went about this new cliffhanger. We're given the chance to actually feel like, you know, they had a happy ending and aren't going to have to go through that ordeal again. But this film is just, oh my god, this film is way messier than the first one. It's, it's a hodgepodge of those ideas from the original. It's even worse in terms of how loosely it's been constructed and how terribly it was concluded. This film did even less to impress audiences when it came out, and I can see why. Perhaps we're the first film, though slow, and boring, and slow. At least it had a coherent, though albeit abruptly ending, story. The, the second film just barely scrapes by it making any sense, and, and, and even that, it's, it's just barely. I, what? What is, what is happening? Number seven. So, so was this scary? No. No, the, no, no, the answer is no. Insidious 1 and 2 were not, were not actually scary films. If you were scared by them, then, then chances are you, you, you were actually simply just shocked by them. Uh, you experienced a temporary sensation of fear because of uh, unknown and sudden events quickly bouncing on the screen at you. Uh, but after the film was over, you, you quickly forgot, you know, most of it. it. It didn't resonate because it wasn't scary. It was just shocking. It, it, it's like going to a haunted house. You weren't in any real danger, so you got through it and you jumped a few times from the spooks and the frights, and but it's not gonna haunt you for years to come, you know. But a good horror movie, which this wasn't, but but a good horror movie is like a miniature experience in actual terror situations. It, it, it'll leave you with memories of it for a while. It's it's the kind of stuff that gives you nightmares. I, Insidious won't give you nightmares. So why do audiences still go to see these films? I mean, enough so that, that, that they made enough money for a third one to be made. Well, I've already talked about the brain's itching obsession with completing stories and how these films always end in cliffhangers, but, but, but I, th I, think, I think it's more than that. See, Insidious came out in 2011, and also coming out that year was, uh, well, Paranormal Activity 3. That's the third one in the series. Paranormal Activity movies, they made the jump scare a big thing for horror movies. And a lot of films were trying to duplicate its appeal. Paranormal Activity was also raking in a shit ton of money at the box office, but that was kind of a thought that was lost on the studios there because these movies were being made on the cheap. 
Pretty much any reasonably sized crowd would make a movie with that low of a budget a lot of money. And, and people, well, people like to see these kind of movies because, well, they're guaranteed scares. They're, they're films where you know you don't have to worry about whether or not you get emotionally invested in these characters in order to be afraid. You know, you go see a movie like Insidious because it's, it's like going to a haunted house. You're guaranteed at least one moment of fear, if not a few, depending on how jumpy a person you are. But does that make it a scary movie? No. No, not really. Here, think about it like this. Uh, going to a movie is kind of like going to a fancy Mexican restaurant. You could take a chance on their food. It'll either be you know, the greatest, you know, Mexican cuisine you've had, or it could just be cheap microwave burritos disguised as food. Or, you could go to Taco Bell. You know, the Mexi Melts always taste the same. And they're on the dollar menu.